Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to Plantech Tuesday. Was anyone here on Plantech Monday? A couple of faces I recognize. And there is also Plantech Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Anyway, uh, uh, so uh, uh, for, for a lot of you hopefully know, uh, 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 Plantech Week uh, is kind of part of a, a week of exploration of how technology can help us plan cities better. Uh, and today we're going to be discussing the potential impact uh, of technology in how we define and understand quality of place. Uh, we've got a, a great panel. Each of them are going to do a quick 10-minute presentation, and we should have about 10 minutes to, uh, 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 for, for questions and answers uh, 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 from the floor. Uh, tweet. Use the hashtag Plantech. You can keep the conversation going after, uh, the, conversation, uh, after, after the, the, the discussion today as well. Uh, so I think without further ado, I think I'll introduce our first speaker, who will be uh, uh, Simona Dobrescu from uh, Steer Davis Glee, uh, also kind of from uh, Colin Buchanan, Atkins, TFL, Acom. I think you've worked for most consultancies in some form of transport way. Yeah. So Probably. over to you. So hello everyone, um, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, let's load the presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna talk today about um, streets as quality places. Um, because my background is mainly in transport planning, um, I'm gonna talk uh, to you about the way we balance the movement and the place functions uh, for streets and how we actually try to achieve quality um, through the design but also through the planning process. Um, and before I start, um, it's good to be here. Um, for those of you that don't know the um, Candy Chang project, um, I totally recommend it. Um, it's a very interesting use of public art to engage people and communities. And really, to give you a short background um, of uh, where I come from and kind of so you can understand my ideas and my take on. on uh, measuring the quality of, of streets and places. So I'm an economist by background, but I turned international transport consultant. And I usually work um, at the intersection of public transport, public space, and pedestrian movement. And today I want to talk about streets because I think they're the places where um, the competing needs um, of, of cities really um, come to interact. And they're very complex and they're very dynamic. And um, what happened um, in the 60s and 70s was that there was a way of thinking about streets that was mainly focused around um, the role of streets as movement corridors. But that has changed over the years. And um, the, the idea that streets are also places for people to, to, to enjoy, for people to use, um, has gained more and more traction. And what came out of that um, over the past um, years has been really a series of tools and guidances and um, a lot of um, ways of, of planning for streets, and especially in London. So TFL is at the forefront of, of these kind of um, tools. Um, you have there the pedestrian comfort guidance. For those of you that don't know it, it really looks at um, the comfort level um, that pedestrians um, need on different types of uh, streets. Um, the alignment of crossings. Uh, you have the pedestrian environment review system, or PERS, um, again, which was supported by TFL, and it's a street audit looking at um, the quality, assessing the quality of, of the street, ranking it from uh, minus three to plus three, so very bad to very good, in terms of maintenance, in terms of lighting, in terms of active frontages, um, in terms of the quality of the pavement, of the design, and so on. And then there are the tools that try to put everything together, um, such as the value of urban realm toolkit, which tries to give a monetary value to um, the number of people using a street um, and the quality or the quality improvement to that street, and what would that translate in terms of um, increase in rental prices or uh, rental um, incomes or residential um, prices. And at the bottom, what I've tried to show is actually all of this is um, 
really underpinned by a lot of data. And um, we're in a very interesting time at the moment where we are transitioning from uh, the very old way of uh, collecting data via surveys and interviews and questionnaires um, to a more kind of um, digital way of collecting it remotely. Um, big data is, uh, is uh, prevalent in a lot of the projects that we do. And um, what that shows you is really continuous monitoring around Oxford Street. Um, on only one side of the street throughout the year, the red bars show you um, the percentage of time in that particular week of the year when Oxford Street was uh, or the northern part only of Nox Oxford Street, um, was considered to be uncomfortable for pedestrians to walk on um, by applying the pedestrian comfort guidance for London. So one of the key questions that um, this session wanted to um, answer was, um, are we going to create identical streets and places? Because we have so much guidance, and now we're going to have even more data to actually inform our decisions and planning. And um, I think what I'm, I'm, I was trying to, to do with the next slides is really to um, make you understand how I think, uh, from my professional experience so far, that we can avoid that and really ask some questions at the end of how we can use technology data um, to, to make better decisions. So first of all, you need to find the, the right balance. Um, this is a typical cross-section. Uh, if we were to look at the guidance um, and to look at, um, at the space that um, all the modes need along the street, from the pedestrians to the public transport to the general traffic, we realize that we need in, in London or in any other city, really, around 20 to 25 meters of width. And you'll be surprised, um, but a lot of places, a lot of streets in London do not actually have that width available. So there is a lot of conflict there, and you need to um, understand how, you can, how you can fix it. Because what can happen is that, I really like that, so that's why I put it in there, but um, you, can, you can freak out because really there is very little space available and to, to offer quality, what is supposed to be quality for everyone, you would need to accommodate all of those needs and all those competing interests. So what I think is very important is to understand the context in which you are planning um, and in which you are trying to achieve quality. Um, you see here, um, this is a TFL street matrix. They've recently developed it, and it, it, it's a really good tool to actually um, start planning and understanding the context where you are um, because it gives you an understanding of what is at the moment there and it also gives you a really nice pathway to where you want to achieve. Um, this matrix tries to balance um, the place and the movement function of the streets. Um, and if you are on a local street and you want to improve it, it depends what are your objectives. But this matrix tells you exactly where you need to go and where you need to invest to actually make that change. You also need to understand the user. Um, so this is a ver very famous quote uh, from William H. White. People tend to sit where there are places to sit. So you usually um, need to keep in mind that you are planning for certain users at a certain moment in time. Um, so irrespective of where you are um, on that matrix, um, you need to get to understand the users of the place, um, both the ones that um, are using the place or the street at the moment, but um, also try to understand what will happen there in the future and how people's behavior is going to change. Another important step in this is uh, to identify what needs to change and why. This is actually from uh, Peckham Town Center, and it's a map of uh, where people cross throughout the day. And um, as you can see, there are places uh, where there's a lot of density of crossing. And um, in this context, you won't be surprised that actually the crossings are right next to the red, li uh, red uh, lines. So people don't really cross where the crossing is at the moment. So understanding what needs to change for people to actually um, feel safer um, on that street or to um, cross in the right position, it's very important. Um, and another question that is also important is why, because we tend 
sometimes to um, jump to the conclusion that something really needs to change. Um, and that change can be quite substantial. Um, but there are ways sometimes in which you can improve with uh, very small change. And this leads me to the final slide and really to the question that I would like to uh, actually throw out in the room. Um, and in the section of identifying the impact, so you've gone through all the process and you've decided what you're going to do, why you're doing it. Um, you need to have um, a look in the future and see what the impacts of what you are proposing are going to be. And another quote by William H. White says that what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. So what happens is that uh, if you follow this process and you reach the conclusion that you're going to improve the quality of space or the quality of the street, is there a place in that moment or in that process of continuous improvement of the street where you actually reach peak quality? What I mean by that is, if you look at Oxford Street, for example, that I showed you before, um, there is a risk that improving continuously, you actually cr attract more and more people, which makes it more uncomfortable throughout the day for people to be there. So there is an element of um, questioning uh, when are improvements actually benefiting in a meaningful way, or is that marginal improvement too small to actually make a difference? Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Simona. Uh, I think, uh, really interesting, lots of questions. Keep your questions for later. Uh, apologies to, to anyone who, who's, who's arriving now. There might have been a bit of mix up in timing. Our uh, events team tell me. But next speaker, uh, Ed Holloway from uh, Bleep Studio. Beep Studio, uh, over to you to do any instructions. Thank you. Um, I'm an architect by trade, um, educator, uh, and general sort of ne'er do well. We do all sorts of things uh, relatively well. Um, and very pleasure to speak here today. Um, I really didn't quite sure how to address the issue of quality because I'm an architect and not a planner. So I thought I'd use some of the example projects that we've actually gone through. Um, Ewan asked us to discuss what makes good urban design and architecture, and obviously the context of the tech um, and big data discussions that are going on. Um, I wanted to try and ally the discussion to that. Um, how can we quantify the quality of the place? Well, from my perspective, um, as a, a, a creative person operating in space, that's an impossible question, um, and we have to work in a very esoteric and uh, intuitive way to be able to actually have an influence on that. Um, I guess that the sub-question could be, how do we know it's a good design? Um, or, or how do we persuade someone that it's a good design? And big data sets often can help to legitimize things because they appear to be a scientific modality as opposed to something uh, artistic, perhaps. So um, I was thinking about the hierarchy and design approach to quality. Um, if it's designed by me, then it's good, isn't it? Because I know it's been done before. If it's designed by us, then we know more. So a collaborative team is better than the individual. But if it's designed by you, because you know best, then it could be the best thing, possibly. Uh, a technologically engaged end user. Um, but public realm is very complicated. It is effectively a democratic space, in, for the most part, not all of London, obviously. Um, and it's perceived as com complex, um, but we can't take it all in, really. Um, so what gives us an authenticity as designers in the public realm? So I've chosen three projects that I've worked on over the years, um, and they all use fairly large data sets to, to determine the design outcome. Um, this is very early stuff, some of it, and some of it's uh, a little off, off piece now. Uh, so number one, Horniman to Totems. Um, we basically initiated this project. Um, it was a design workshop held in Forest Hill to try and get people to get involved in uh, a bit of urban design. So we invited lots of designers. And there's identified four little piazza spaces along the Dartmouth Road. Um, there's quite a lot of Forest Hill in this presentation because I live there and work there. Um, but yeah, four different places. So we identified that each of those would have a different character in the streetscape. They have different uh, contexts, different history period of building, um, and a different scale, but they all link up. 
Um, just at the top of the hill is the Horniman Museum. The Horniman Museum has a fantastic collection um, on display. Unfortunately, most of it is in the uh, back rooms and back catalogues, and that really doesn't um, give the public any access to it. So they have a problem about accessing a large amount of volumetric data and engaging their end user. Um, so we decided, what if you could actually put all of those objects, uh, catalog online, and then allow individuals to actually um, choose them, choose your favorite object. Um, the totem pole, this will come together in a sec, <laughs> is, a, uh, is emblematic of a hierarchical relationship of, um, of, of family and community and spiritualness. Uh, and it's an emblem which is used by the Horniman. So our idea was to try and identify, uh, help people relate to spaces rather than just observe them as a passive act, a part of their experience. It was actually to try and engage them on a personal level with something that actually uh, was of their own authorship. So here, what the idea is that different neighborhood regions or wards, if you like, actually come together and they, they, they will look through the, the database, they'll vote on their favorite objects and collectively they'll have a, a little amalgam of um, interesting pieces, uh, which are all made up of these objects. They then embody them in place and everyone eventually uh, gets to see part of their activity as a community member in a public space. And so there's constantly, um, well, there's immediately a, a response to their desires embodied in the public realm. The next project, Oldham Artwork, the Thorpe Pavilion. Um, this is a crazy project. It was all, it's 2008 we came up with this. Um, the idea here was to use EEG measuring tools. Um, a pavilion building created by thinking about a pavilion building. Um, the idea here was that we would get the residents of Oldham to actually sit in an EEG recording and get them to watch magic eye pictures. Magic eye pictures would suddenly get a point of cognition where they'd see a primitive, so a cube, a, a pyramid, a cylinder, a sphere. Um, and for each of these data recordings that we recorded at the moment of cognition, we'd have a brainwave. That brainwave would then be used as a database against which we'd invite great thinkers uh, to imagine a thought pavilion, a pavilion generated out of the thoughts of the population. What happened? Well, collecting people's thoughts is against their human rights. So um, that's the end of that one. <laughs> but that was in 2008, and maybe things have changed a little bit. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is Havelock Walk. Um, this is where our studio is based. It's a creative community that works along a cobble muse, uh, and we open to the public twice a year. We have a lot of people coming through. Um, this is what it looks like on an average day, a little bit gray, quite pretty, I think. You can all make your value judgments on that. This is our studio, and I wondered about how we look to the public in terms of quality here, because we've got a little bit of um, rotting stone, uh, leaking walls. We love it, though. Oh, yeah, there's another bit of quality. Would you ever plan or determine a streetscape that would incorporate cobbles, tarmac, curbstones in this haphazard array? It's not of quality, but it has a quality. That quality compromises us sometimes as a family. Um, this is a cobble come, a, come astray, and the impact is brutal. However, oh yeah, is this a plant or is it a weed? We're not sure, it's very pretty. So, but when we do our activation of this stuff for events, the whole quality of the street changes. Suddenly, we put some bunting up, we roll out the AstroTurf, and you've got a ready-made community out there ready to welcome the public. And this is about augmenting space. This is about beyond the pragmatic and the fixed. It's about um, the activities of the streetscape and about how community can act and improve and embody a spirit or, you know, they have a voice and a plurality. Um, so this one was just a quick project we knocked up for last summer where we built a, we got a skip for the summer, planked it all up, covered it in um, a pond liner and turned it into a swimming pool. So that was the Havelock Walk Skipoozy. Um, another time, well, we'll just inflate our sculpt air sculpture across the, the, the thing, and that's suddenly incredible fun as well. Um, adding music to the street was another modality which really improved uh, people's experience. 
And then obviously the last thing, adding, f oh, not quite the last thing, adding food to the street. Uh, again, that is another thing that generates a lot of positive outcomes. And the quality and the perception of that space is hugely, hugely good because if we fed everybody. Um, last note, I mean, I'm very interested in data algorithms. Um, I'm very interested about feedback mechanisms. I'm interested about sort of second order cybernetics and the way that um, we can actually have iterative um, uh, design inputs and feedback loops where we've got things like homeostatic, um, almost like a biological system um, feeding back onto our community. That's a fascinating premise, but I feel it's full of oversimplifications potentially. But, um, that's probably because I don't have the capacity in my mind to actually use that as a data analysis tool, um, but I believe that it is possible. However, how would you write in the require for put putty? Putty, yeah. Pooty, little, little cherubs. That's never going to come out of a design algorithm. You know, it's never going to be a feedback mechanism that we need pooty in our street. But we put them in the street. There's a couple there. Pooty. More pooty, there you go. So, yeah, this is the last augmentation, most recent augmentation to Havelock Walk. Uh, David Mack, quite a famous artist, basically gave each of us a cherub and asked us to design it for him. And that's the quality that we added to the street this year. Okay, I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, who likes Putty? I'm not sure I like Putty, but we, we, we can, we can, uh, we can move, uh, um, ask these questions later. Uh, uh, next, uh, we've got uh, Nick Boyd-Smith from uh, Create Streets. Uh, if anyone hasn't come across Create Streets, Create Streets is a group that promotes the uh, uh, quality in streets and buildings. I think right here, I hadn't realized this. Over to Brilliant. you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I feel a campaign coming on. Create Pooty. That's, that's, that's got a ring to it. Um, I partly grew up in Forest Hill, and, and I love the uh, uh, Holman Museum. So thank you, thank you for your work there. Um, right, so I think we're, we're going to have a slightly different take, because um, we would, I think, say that you can measure good places, and that if the, at an at a individual level, quality is subjective, but at a population level, quality is very objective and measurable and actually predictable. So I think there's one sort of key point, I think. Um, can you measure good places? We say you can, or put differently, is this correct? When, um, when developers advertise like this, are they putting the wool over our eyes, or are they uh, rationally using data? Because there is, as, as you will all know, a, a rapidly growing amount of data about subjective well-being, about physical health, about walkability, about health, about air quality. I'll, I'll go on about all that in a moment. Um, and I think our key contention is that uh, many developers, possibly some planners, certainly some architects, uh, certainly many commentators on it, are actively misusing some of that data. Or at any rate, to be perhaps more charitable, are only reading and understanding bits of it. So if you are bored by what I'm saying already, here are some of the key points I'm going to make, and then you can switch off the next eight minutes. So yes, there's lots of data out there. Use it. Find it. It's going up in quality and in quantity every day. But key point number two, be wide, not narrow. Most uh, writers, commentators in this space, and I'm probably one of them, have an obsession with two or three areas. But actually the data is broader, and, and the qualities of urban design are in constant and to some degree unknowable tension with each other. If you increase the light to this room here, you might be decreasing the amount of urban quality outside. You can't ever completely resolve those tensions, but you have to be aware that they're there in your attempts to measure urban quality and well-being and, and, and value. Um, Ed, you touched on this. Trust people. You, you're right. You can't have a design code or a planning framework that says create putty, uh, at least not one I've ever seen. Um, but what you can do is you can build in, and I mean this very seriously, you can build in proper checks to understand that what is being developed or proposed is genuinely popular, by which I mean not just its use, but also its aesthetics and its urban form, its typology, its fine grainness. That may not quite get you to putty 99 times out of 100, but it could create putty. Sorry, I'm picking up on that theme un unreasonably. And I think I'll jump over the next two points, so I don't think I'll have time for them. Um, if you haven't heard of this man, you should do. Uh, I recommend him all to you, David Halpern, who runs the Cabinet Office Behaviour Insight Unit, often known as the Nudge Unit. Um, he wrote one of the early books on this space, Mental Health and the Built Environment, published in 1990-something. Uh, it is still available on Amazon. Buy it. 
That's my advice to you. Um, uh, I'm going to come back to this, we'll have the time, but we would argue you can start to use the data to pull to that together. This is some work we're doing thanks to Ewan and his colleagues with Space Syntax, which we're calling Street Score, and we're starting to scrape that data, Simone, that you were talking about, from you know, the rapidly growing amount of data available on height, age of buildings, greenery, trees, air quality, and actually put it together into a matrix Oops, Sorry, to start trying to measure quality. It will never be perfect because there's a value judgment and a little bit of guesswork in there as well as empirical science in there, and that is necessarily un and unavoidably so. But uh, this will be you know, coming to a website near you soon, and I think, I think it actually is quite exciting. We're certainly excited about it, and actually I'll, I'll talk about it more in a moment. So just um, a couple more uh, quick points. These are some of the key drivers that we see in the research, either secondary or primary, that we've done that links together urban form and well-being, physical health, mental health, children doing well, older people knowing their you know, residents. Greenery, but which doesn't mean the maximum amount of necessarily, in fact doesn't. Nature of the homes, height of buildings, connectivity in streets, land use, mix those amenities up. Nature of the block size, nature and amount of public space and also semi-private space in buildings, that's a bad thing. Beauty and design, I'll emphasize that because it's one of the least talked about. Any development that most people don't regard as something aesthetically nice to look at is missing a key trick. Um, nature of the facades, obviously the many doors, narrow fronts model, uh, and the density where, and I think this is a key point that possibly slightly contradicts Simone, I'm not sure, maybe says the same. Um, you know, there are advantages to a high density urban center. Walkability, you can get to walk to school, you can walk to the office, you can walk and fit it all in, you tend to do more things physically. There are also, and this is an unfashionable thing to say, but it is true in the data, there are advantages to a suburban life form, which is why about 80% of British people prefer it. You have more personal space. The most clear elasticity in values, or one of the most clear, is personal space for your home and for your garden. And you may not like that, but, but it is true. Um, the, if you like, the old inner Victorian suburb, where you're getting some of the advantages of urbanism, the walkability, but all some of the, also some of the advantages advantages of a bit more personal space and a bit more personal communal greenery seems to be the area where you, you get those trade-offs right. So we see a, if you like a sweet spot in that middle density where you get uh, advantages from the both ends of the bell curve. Um, I'll jump over this quickly other than to say that we see in many of the developments or planning applications, we see massive focus on greenery, connectivity and to a lesser extent space and probably often insufficient focus in the data on, on some of the others. Um, I'm not going to talk to that uh, other than to say we would put all the data together and I'm going to be a bit provocative here into not necessarily historically looking but this type of urban form where you're getting actually very high densities but in a finely grained urban walkable structure um, which can both be uh, specifically local but also universal. Brownstone houses, European, lots of small, yet readily accessible uh, private or communal green spaces, not the, the necessarily just the, the big parks. And I, was, I came up with that poster earlier. We're very suspicious when we see developers using the same words and meaning uh, something completely opposite. So... Um, just calling something a garden doesn't make it a garden. That's not to say that the American embassy shouldn't look like something from Star Trek. Maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. I don't know. But, but, but it isn't a garden, and calling it one does not make it so. Uh, and similarly, and I apologize, I've used this slide before. Some of you may have seen it. Um, my point isn't that it shouldn't have Malaysian investment, but calling it a square doesn't make it so. Now, we know, why do they call it a square? Because people love squares, because it's exactly all those elements of the urban form. It's private and public together, it's communal, it's well-overlooked green space, it's well-contained. Five minutes, I've got 20 more minutes to go, don't worry. Um, uh, similarly, just calling something a village doesn't make it a village. Um, I know there's a trendy concept of the urban village, but the, the reason it is used by developers is they're, they're trying to make black equal white. Um, and similarly, calling a building or development human scale does not make it so. Um, uh, uh, my point isn't that this is good or, or bad or indifferent. It's just that it's not human scale. The fact that they feel the need to call it so should make us worried. It is Brobdignagian uh, in, in its grandeur. Um, come back to that. I'll, I'll jump over these, I think. So just, I, I'm actually going to jump over. The, the, there's lots more I could say about some of the data, but I don't think I'll have time to do today. Um, so uh, what I will say, however, is that all the research, and forgive me for what I'm about to do, is beautifully summarized in our book, Heart in the Right Street, available in almost no bookshops, but available in some. Um, but I'll pull out a couple of themes quickly. One is, and this I think is quite an important one, greenery is a good thing, and there's lots of research that correlates it with better mental health and, and well-being, but it isn't always better. There are 
situations in which it's not or which it's not used, there's lots of evidence that lots of greenery put into the urban framework in the last 20 years has degraded through lack of uh, money to keep it going. So just because a developer says it's greenery does not mean that it's going to correlate with well-being in the longer term. But that's not anti-greenery, it's just, it's just a careful caution. I'm going to jump over this. Uh, another one just to be a bit provocative, and, and you may get provoked by this, I don't know. Um, this is a quotation from uh, Canadian academic Robert Gifford, who's done the only academic uh, peer-reviewed survey of the correlations between living in a big building and well-being. Uh, this just jumps around. We've added to that, so we've looked at research done in the last 15 years, and we find, as he does, that in most of the, the data, not quite all of it, you, you can see the, the findings there, actually living in a very big building correlates with lower well-being outcomes than the people who live in it. Two caveats. One is that some of the research is quite old, and I don't think properly controls for urban form, and the second is that the vast majority of the research is done at lower wealth groups, where they struggle often in the, the funding arrangement to pay for the buildings as they age. Big buildings work much better for richer people, just as a as a statement of fact. Um, what's any rate of informed judgment? Three probable key drivers for that to do with children, how people behave with each other, and historically, but not anymore, crime. And another key factor is the, is the, is, is the long-term running costs, where big buildings, and particularly high buildings, seem to go up exponentially as they age. So we're often of the, uh, the Barbican uh, Shakespeare Tower here, cited at us to say that we're wrong when we say that. Uh, the Shakespeare Tower, you may like it, you may loathe it. Uh, the service charges for two-bedroom flat are over £8,000 a year. That's lovely if you can afford it. But the point is that is never going to be an answer for quality and well-being for the majority of the people, uh, I think. Uh, I will jump over that and that. And I want to just quickly, I mean, there's more we could talk about here. I just want to quickly talk about one more uh, thing here. I'm deliberately trying to pull out some of the more provocative ones. Uh, sorry, I'm, is it too funny or just too awful? Sorry. Um, but um, uh, steps. Now, as we will know, since 1999, it's been very, very hard, for good reasons, to, to build a front door with steps to it, uh, for reasons of disabled access, which on the face of it seems absolutely unarguable. Um, except that the only piece of longitudinal research looking at use of steps in the domestic environment and long-term physical health for senior citizens in America, that's the only piece of looking at, at steps, shows that you can probably guess what's coming. Uh, older citizens who live in buildings with steps to the front door stay physically fitter for longer. Because guess what? Using steps is actually very good for you if you, can, if you can do it. Now, that's not to say we don't worry about people who can't use steps, but we should worry about people who can as well. Uh, there's lots of evidence in a commercial environment showing that commercial buildings which have bad lifts and good steps, that the people who work in them are physically fitter. So, you know, the data can be and is misused, or perhaps more honestly, or more, more, more fairly, is, is, is incompletely understood or researched. So we think this is a terribly, terribly important area. Um, I'm going to jump over that. This is just a, a sneak preview of some of our upcoming research. Our next book, which is not yet available in bookshops, but will be soon, uh, which is called Beyond Location. And we've done a, a big data survey looking at correlations between urban morphology and value and index of multiple deprivation in London and in five other cities. Here's a sneak preview of some of the findings from London. I'll just quickly talk about value on the left. So this is the additional value. These are, these are, these are pounds that are associated uh, with certain uh, elements either of the building or of the urban morphology. Let me just pull out one or two provocative functions. Areas which have a higher than average number of pre-1900 properties are worth £58,000 more than areas with less. That's adjusting for other factors. So that isn't because of something else, that's because of that. Um, areas, uh, buildings in, a, in an area with a higher than average intersection density, that's a measure, if you like, of a traditional street pattern, are worth £57,000 more. The new build premium, where is it? It's down here somewhere. That's it. New build premium is associated with just under £9,000 of value, being close to a listed building or a high quality park with £50,000. Now that's a figure that should make a developer uh, freak out, I hope. Um, I've got one more minute. Or oh, that's a shut up. Okay. Um, beauty affects behavior. This is some great work from Happy City in, in the US. Uh, ten, hang on, no, five times as many people offered to help lost or apparently lost tourists, it was actually faked students, um, in front of this building versus this. They're in the same part of, uh, I forget if it's Vancouver or Seattle. Um, people behave differently in front of different types of buildings. And I'm going to jump over all this, just talk for two seconds about Street School, then I'll stop. So this is the work we're currently doing with Ewan and his colleagues, where we've taken 11 categories. We're working with streets, uh, space and tax on it. Greenery, homes, height, connectivity, land use, block, space, beauty and design, facades, density and air quality. And we've taken... 25 underlying drivers. Some of those are very robust. Some, you know, the data is frankly less good. Um, we couldn't do this outside London at the moment. We've done it for Greenwich. Um, we've had to uh, uh, try harder on some than others. 
and it's sort of working. No, it is working. It's correlating with value. It's correlating with longevity. It's correlating weekly with index multiple deprivation. This is not done by us. So if you like, this is what the machine is now spitting out when we try and measure the quality of a street. Um, this is one of the worst performing streets. We've done it for Greenwich, but we've had to do it for the area around the borough, if you like, to make it work. So this is actually embarking. So that, I think that's not a good place to live. I think, would we agree with that? Would you like to live there? Lots of green space. Lots of green space. Readily available electricity, but not a good place to live. Um, this is uh, third quartile, so that actually looks okay. Um, and this is up a bit, that's suburban, but remember that a lot of the suburban data is correlated with higher well-being and higher physical health. Um, and this is one, I think this is actually, it's changed a bit since then, but when it, we ran it about two weeks ago, this was the highest performing street. And you, I think, can see why. And this is not done by us, so this is the machine finding this. You know, walkable streets, clearly high quality green space nearby. I think there's some local shops around the corner. So it seems to be coming up with good answers. And uh, that's it, really. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much. A lot of food for thought there. Uh, kind of qu questions which we'll address later. Quality equals popularity. And this idea of a perfect urban development. Is there such a thing? Uh, so next up, we've got uh, uh, Josh Artis from Centric Lab that's going to take us, I guess, one step deeper into the mind. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for all the speakers beforehand, and a big congratulations for everyone being here on a sunny Tuesday lunch, learning on a lunchtime session. That's great. That's what gives me inspiration in the face of everything else that's going on in the world. So um, my name is Josh Artis. I'm a co-founder of a, a company called The Centric Lab. We're a neuroscience research lab focused on the built environment. We're also protagonists of something called the Conscious Cities Movement, which is about how through the data analysis, AI, and sort of progressive technologies, can we inform architecture and design and urban planning to design what we call more conscious cities? So um, I was asked by Ewan and uh, Steph, who I don't know if he's in the room, uh, to, to join today to ask from our point of view, perhaps what is good architecture? My personal answer is something that's timeless. And I think that's one of the most important things is when you start to walk around London or even just pick up like a Google map and just go around London, you can see the majority of the buildings that are being demolished today um, tend to look like this. They're either these or they're sometimes the sort of the pre-Victorian, tiny little sort of freehold buildings that are on a large plot of land. And the assumption is that because they're sort of their inputs, perhaps the amount of space they're taking up or the rent that they might be generating for that owner or the fact they're really expensive to maintain are no longer of use. And that's a fair economic assumption. But when you get to buildings like these, these enormous blocks that were built with a purpose, they were built with an economic purpose. Um, at a time perhaps when a lot of sort of modernist thinking post the war was about, well, we have a static economy, we, we, we've worked out the future, we've worked out that if we get this many people in a space, we're going to have the following uh, values and uh, ideas created, the following businesses exist, but we are now at a point where we're tearing down properties, we are wasting money, we are wasting time, we are wasting carbon emissions. Uh, there are, I, I'm trying to remember, it's, I think it's 1.3 trillion bricks are produced annually, which equate, I think it was, it's either 800 or 830 million tons of carbon dioxide go into the, um, go into the, uh, some, some the word for me, uh, the atmosphere, it, which is the same as running the internet for the entire year. So it feels that timelessness is an important thing, not only in our, in our enjoyment and our experience of a property, but also there is an ecological factor towards it. So the idea of what's good and what's bad, I mean, I'm not gonna preach about what I think is good, um, I think it's more important to sort of understand how do we get to good. And I think the one of the most timeless things is actually people. I don't think we have re really changed that much. Um, if anyone's a fan of George Orwell um, and you haven't read the novella Why I Write, which he wrote, I think, in 1946, right at the end of the war, you'll see that in generally the British people have not changed one iota in about 70 years. And that people are actually one of the most static things and that in, in reality we have always thrived and desired spaces that are either about enhancing our intellect and our knowledge, such as the Urban Innovation Center, um, places that have intrigued us, places that we have brought us together to have an experience, to create an output beyond our traditional means. And I think that's, that's one of the most exciting things. These are spaces that meet our core attributes as human beings. Sorry, I sometimes do need notes to, to go through. Um, you know, so the question is, how do we understand what the idea of learning, the understanding the idea of fun, the understanding the idea of uh, creating, how do we understand these in order to create spaces that enhance these capabilities? 
rather than, I think, if we look back at things like these, designing for a cultural zeitgeist. And I think there is a fallacy sometimes in a lot of um, modern design and architecture to design something that's very of the now. And I think if something is now, it means it's useless tomorrow. So how do we understand experience? I'm going to get a little bit about what we do um, at Centric. So um, we are in the processes of sort of finishing off our uh, technology, which is called Noble, uh, which stands for Neuroscience of the Built Environment. And that's what happens when you let scientists get branding on something. Um, we are informed by cognitive neuroscience, which is the study of the brain and to a lesser extent, the uh, central nervous system. Uh, the purposes is to, and I'm gonna walk in front of the screen, everybody's pictures, but the way that we look at understanding experience is one, you actually have to understand the people and their context. I think that's the most important thing. Why are we, who are we designing for? It's not about designing for a purpose, we're actually designing for an outcome. So what we look at are uh, developing things called cognitive profiles, which is really how, how we learn, how we memorize our attention spans, our attention patterns, and it's almost an IQ test for your sort of your your brain and your visual system in that way, um, our, our scientists are particularly focused on uh, cognitive neuroscience. We're partnered with UCL in a data and research capacity, and uh, Dr. Hugo Spears is our sort of scientific director. He's a long-term specialist in things like spatial navigation. So everything mentioned before about uh, space syntax modeling, um, he's worked with companies like uh, Deutsche Telekom to advance Alzheimer's research and designing. Uh, uh, sort of grid patterns that get an understanding of how do people get lost. Um, they've done a, a ton of fantastic work about um, sometimes why why we get why we get lost, why we forget where we're going in the public realm, and also why we how using a GPS sat nav makes you makes your brain dumb is another thing that he's got into. Um, so the idea is to oh, bear with me. Um, understand developing cognitive profiles, which is quite objective. It takes a lot of neuroscience data to understand the variables about how we understand things in people. Then looking at, well, what are the tasks that people need to do? We, we understand that there are sort of neuroscience is now building up a sort of a body of research in understanding how our brain is processing memory and how we recollect that memory. And sometimes what environments are detracting from that? you know, our environments and our aspects and elements of our built environment, increasing the sort of the, the bad chemicals in our bodies, the cortisol, are we getting over layered of the negative chemicals in our body through aspects of the built environment that are preventing our ability to have sort of cognitive flexibility to be able to jump and balance multiple ideas in any one go. It's actually a, a skill set that a lot of data programmers, web developers often need. That's why they're often stuck in with their uh, headphones on the whole time because actually balancing a series of languages, a series of hypotheticals, a series of what has come before and what will be to understand what do I need to create. So the idea is how can we get an understanding of how people are are having a desired output and I think that's the most important thing is what is good is what are we defining as good what is our output are we trying to increase productivity and I mean that in a scientific point of view and then understanding well what are the mental states and the physical comforts that we can play a variance with so uh, a material comfort will be the levels of light so the proportions of uh, natural light against artificial light if it's artificial light, is it LED light or is it other sort of luminescent technologies? LEDs can make your brain exhausting. Do you want to be under an LED light nine hours a day? You're not going to be very productive if your brain is quite exhausted. So the purpose is to try and understand what are these qualities that might enhance our ability, abilities for sort of autonomy, our abilities for seclusion, where we can actually find spaces that suit us. You know, the idea in a lot of sort of agile, um, agile working, which is very... Uh, which is one of probably where all workspaces are going to go, is how you find a space that's suitable for you to suit the task that you need to perform in your own time. It's the sort of pop pop popular flexible working idea. So what we do is take this on a sort of a data point of view and try and analyze what are the heuristics that designers, planners, architects, engineers can understand more about human behavior and respond to it to inform their brief. We don't design, we don't think science actually designs. Science informs design. I think the only time a science can get involved in design is when you have very, very specific human problem. And I think that when it comes to things like people with severe Alzheimer's, people with severe uh, schizophrenic conditions. Um, I'm sure most of the guys, and actually I was really, I actually want to talk to you afterwards about your uh, study that you did in Oldham because uh, EEG technology, which is the uh, skull caps there, um, is, it's still a questionable 
uh, material to use. There's a lot of white noise and a lot of data that comes out of it that can be very irrelevant. So you have to be very conscious about how you use these technologies and ethical in what you're saying. You can't just use, you know, here there's about 60 or so pods. You can't use the ones that you can buy off Amazon, which got eight little pods that you stick on your head and go, oh, that bit, the brain lit up when they looked at that. They must be happy. I, it's, it's BS, basically. And there's a lot of science to prove that's incorrect. So the idea is to understand how the combination of technologies, how to understand sort of ethical responsibilities and the assumptions you draw from using neuroscience, from um, EEG to mobile eye tracking, wearable devices and GPS navigation and the whole sort of IoT sensor. Can we start to understand what we want to be building? Um, the reason we do it is very simply we have changed our market, our economies. Everything has changed. We are now in the experience economy, and we have probably been for about 20 odd years, but very few people have had sort of the data and the reasoning to actually apply this. The way that the, our built environment is funded and organized are in predictive models. And so I, th th this quote to me stood out dramatically. Um, in how we're going to go forward. And I think um, very simply, how are we going to do? Why are we doing this? Well, we have to be able to design schools that, and cities that don't scare children who, have, who might have autism. My younger brother has autism. He can't come to central London. Do I think central London is good? No, I think it's a mess. I'm born in London and I'm fed up with this city because it's a city of uh, uh, wealth and hell being is where I put it at the moment. But this is, um, this is a school in Japan that understood the differences of... Uh, the, the anxiety that children were getting from going from their countryside homes to the big open plan schools, the idea of a big square of a big new Ooh, uh, a big new development is a garden. No, it's horrible. A lot of people don't like big open plan land. So they redesign their schools to be more like uh, the homes. How can we understand dementia better? How people visually recognize and understand space? And very simply, how do we understand workspaces where we spend the majority of our life that aren't tiring and exhausting our brains, that are places that are enhancing our general sense of health and well-being? So that's where I see uh, as good architecture, and that's what we do at the Centric Lab. So thank you very much for everyone for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Josh, and, and thank you very much to, uh, to all the panelists. Hopefully, there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of questions. If the panelists can take a seat here, that'd be great, and uh, we'll take uh, questions from the floor. Uh, if you can say uh, who you are and uh, and and who the question is directed to, let me just have a show of hands. Who's got a question? Just to get an idea of timing. Who's got questions to ask? Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be a bit selfish. I'm going to start off with a question myself, if that's okay. And 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 it's to you, Nicholas. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you mentioned you, you you talked about beauty and you talked about design, uh, and and you you talked a lot about quality, and quite often you associated that to popularity. Does that not mean that quality comes down to lowest common denominator, and would that be a problem? And I think. Um I guess what I was saying was necessarily a bit of a rush because I was trying to deliberately squeeze in lots in a, in a short period of time to provoke thought. Um, I think there are, there are different ways at a population level of measuring quality. And actually, you're, I think you touched on some of them. We're getting better at better at understanding uh, stated well-being, subjective well-being, if you like. So you can measure that. What's the correlation between stated well-being and a building or a city or a neighborhood? That's one way. We can clearly measure physical health, mental health, longevity, uh, levels of stress. These are all, uh, the, those things I just listed are all things that in lots of research in many countries are consistently and really reasonably reliable, it's never completely perfect, uh, you know, linked to well-being. So there are, there are good health uh, and mental state of mind uh, things that I think we should be measuring and, and linking to urban form, and we can. Uh, and yes, I think then popularity is a, is, a, is, a, is a third look. Do people like it? Do people say, perhaps this is a better way of asking the question, do people say they want to be here? These are, these are good measures. I think another measure, not, not the only one, but I think a reasonable necessary one, uh, it would change from economy to economy, is what would people pay to buy this or to live here or to set up an office here? Um, I think so, you know, you can't just choose one of them, but I think they're a legitimate range. If I may, just one more point, which I think your question implies, which I think is important. We're talking about planning here. Um, some of our work quotes an economist called Paul Cheshire, who some of you may know, who, who works uh, in London. Um, he's a, I'm fair to say, a critic of planning. And he would say, lots of planning 
ultimately it comes down to the subjective viewpoint of a planner or the councillor who to whom the planner re reports and that's no good because actually you need to measure it and you know economics can measure because it, it puts a pound or a dollar sign to it um i think in his more lucid moments he concede and we'd certainly argue that you do need to get a comparable metric which is not just pounds and if we don't think hard about those if you like measures of planning quality and popularity should be one but not the only one of those we're left with a purely homo economicus approach to what we build. Homo economicus is one legitimate approach to the built environment, but in itself it's not sufficient. So there you go, there's an attempt at an answer. If you can pass on the mic to Ed, Ed you showed that image of uh, cobbles and tarmac. I think a lot of public ground designers would say, well, that's a bit of a mess, but you quite liked it. Well, it's, it's a qualitative aspect of my street. Whether I like it, um, it is a character. And, and I guess the homogeneity of um, the potential data analysis leading us to monocultural or, or mono, mono systematic places is, is the worry. Um, I guess I guess I, I follow what you're saying absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to know a little bit more actually again about how how you define the edge of the data set um, and at what point there's a sort of flip into something which is in a personal space and a personal related issue that affects well-being and happiness in the public realm. And yes, there's like, there are mechanisms and recorded data sets as you identified about Alzheimer's, um, young people being scared of environments as well, and, and qualitative spaces of green space. But I guess it's that threshold. It's like, where do we actually layer event? Or where do we layer the serendipity to occur? How, how do we make accommodation for that within um, more rigorous structures, I suppose, what seem to be more rigorous structures? So before before you answer, Nick, I'll, I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, you guys might have some good questions right at the back there. <laughs> yes. I'd spoken on much, but I guess. I think I understand your question. Um, some of the things are much easier to measure than others. So I think there are two ways of answering your question, if I understand it. One is that um, we, we don't yet have a metric directly, we've got some proxies for, if you like, variety in a pattern, which is what we would argue from the data we've seen in the research is a, it's a good type of urban environment, one of which that Muse would score very highly, by the way. Um, so um, at the moment, we're taking age of buildings as a proxy for that, which is not perfect. And we, you know, we don't pretend that it is, but it's, it's the best we've got. It's actually not a bad one, because if you take a random street built in 1850, 1910, 1930, 1960, they do actually, on the whole, I mean, you know, they, this is big data, not street specific. They do tend to have that theme. There will clearly be exceptions, and we'd, we'd be the first to say so. Um, second bit of the answer, if I understood you correctly, is that um, there's, there's some science in there. We, we can say with reasonable confidence these things tend to be associated with good outcomes. And at a city level or at a neighborhood level, we can to some degree say how much, and there seems to be some consistent variety, but also consistency in the data. What is much harder to do, and this is what we've spent most of the time doing, and we'll never get it quite right, is, is if you like, and I think this is how you add them up. And the right answer will be different in different places. Um, and we're still trying to get our heads around this. So we you know we've done it for Greenwich and we're still working on it. And I, you know, but um I would imagine that were we to do this in Manchester or in Leeds, we would end up with a, a different way of adding it up than to Greenwich. What I don't yet have a head head round is whether we should be running it differently in Greenwich to Barking or Barking to RBKC. Um but I think it's a, a good question and I'd I'd love to have the answer to it, but come back in a few months and hopefully we will. <laughs> See you afterwards then. 
And, and, and uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think if I can add on to that, uh, you mentioned Greenwich and you mentioned bar barking. Uh, can we also apply this to, to, to Seoul and to Mumbai? Or, is, or does culture become, become an important differentiation in what we consider quality? And the, the, the two answers to that, which is a very, very good question. I mean, one is technically no, because the data sets will be different, but that's not really what you're asking. Um, I mean, not quite, but I suspect more than you think would be my partly guessed answer. The reason I say partly guessed is, I mean, my, um, my Korean and my Chinese is not that good. Um, but we have actually read some research on Singapore and a more limited degree on Hong Kong. And actually, the behavior and the economic patterns you see there are, are a bit less different than you might think. Um, so certainly, some of the economics of where people who can afford to choose to live in Hong Kong is not as variant as you, as you might think. So yes, there will be cultural differences. But I think, Josh, I think you were saying this, the human has not changed that much in size or in some of its basic physiological and emotional needs. So I suspect the differences might be less than we imagine. I must let someone if I can just compliment uh, John, your point, um, how can you measure beauty or something like that? And I think um, one of the things that attracted me to work with scientists, and this is as someone who got a double C at GCSE, yeah, and I'm an artist by uh, education and by, and by life. I love the built environment. But one of the things that I found fascinating about uh, neuroscience is the way it has been um, able to articulate and define semantics of experience. So the idea of designing for fun or designing for beauty is completely ethereal, existential of the moment. But understanding, as you're saying, that these quite, there are universal commonalities into how we are, uh, how our eyes will uh, will gaze across an environment. Um, one of our uh, one of our scientists has spent a lot of time understanding autism because people have diff uh, people with autism have different uh, visual attention patterns. They focus on different elements. So there's an interesting parallel, and that's where you define your values in understanding. Right, we're going to look at attention patterns. We're going to look at how attention might relate to dwell, and how and then how from a hierarchy you might go well. As is an area excitable? Are we then correlating that to, to other areas of our of our physiology that are excitable? So it is very important to have a, uh, a structure in what you're measuring to make an assumption. You can say that areas have a higher propensity for for beauty based on their visual diversity. Is it is it beautiful? I, I don't I don't think a science could ever say something is beautiful in that way. I think there's a really important difference. Sorry. Um, between you can answer what do most people say they aesthetically like. Now you can have a long debate about whether that does or doesn't make it beautiful, and I, I don't think I know the answer to that. Is it emotionally beautiful? Is a, is a bigger question. But do most people say they like it, and is the consistency and predictability in that? Yes, the jolly well is. Uh, next question. Yeah. Good. Is it, is it, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to figure out if there's, there's a question there. And I know, so, so it's a question there for, for, for Nick. I'll, 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 try, I'll get it to other people. So, uh, Can I just say one quick question? Yeah. I think something, uh, some of the metrics which identify people's consciousness is actually my labor. But some of them are about the intellectual scale, which is, I think, cultural 
I've got a question about who the tools are for. Who, who are you selling them to? Uh, for, for us, it's architects who, uh, who are valued on user experience. I think it's anyone who is designing an environment to un enhance the user experience. Um, and that's where you can start to understand the qualities and the ratios. And I think what you're talking about in human scale, something that is not human scale are these enormous blocks that are out of context. but a community rather than an isolated. So if you're going to somewhere like Greenwich, a very traditional house, and then you've got these enormous realms and these 12 block falls. I think, I, I, sorry, someone, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Just add a little bit to that. Um, it goes back to one of the slides that I was showing about context. It's very important to measure everything and talk about quality in a very contextual way. Um, and with a very clear aim in, in, in sight of actually what are you looking for? What, what are you trying to achieve? And going back to what we were talking before about that um, street with all of the cobblestones and all everything that uh, maybe if you were to go uh, as a designer and do one of those street audits, you would conclude that it's not up to standard. But if your um, aim on that street was not really that, was maybe to um, augment the, the public space, then that wouldn't matter. It would fall down on your scale of understanding what's the quality of that street. You would be looking at the interventions that were made, um, the way people were using the street, the temporary um, kind of um, street art and everything that was happening there. So it's very important to contextualize everything. So like you said, high rise bu buildings might not be popular in some geographies, but in others they are. And the way we relate to space does uh, matter um, from a cultural point of view as well. So it's great. There's already a lot of tension here, which 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 I can feel. But let's move on. The next question here in a minute. Yeah, so you have to look at everyone that uses the street and uses the space. Um, and this is where quantifying things is very important. Um, because what happens is if you look at the street and you um, put the number of the users that are in a car, in a bus, um, and people that walk on the street, people that cycle. And you don't just um, talk about the number of cars or the number um, of buses. You talk about the number of users using each mode. That's where you understand where you need to prioritize. Usually, public transport in London has to be prioritized because it carries the majority of people. And then um, it's probably pedestrians and cyclists Cyclist. Cars are actually quite low on the, on the priority scale, but it depends again where you are. Because if you're on Oaken Road, which that photo was um, on Oaken Road, it's really very difficult to prioritize because you actually don't have a lot of pedestrians there. But what you have is an aspiration to transform it into a high street. So if, you, if that's your aspiration, then you have to start putting in place the infrastructure for that user to be able to use it comfortably in the future. So it, it, it really depends, but I think the user is the key to your, your question. So we try and get, uh, the, the, I think there's three more questions here. If we start off with you.
what you know about how you see a screen. You know, and mm. you know, if you have a screen everywhere, you have some kind of interaction with what's going on. Like if you have a park, or if you have a park and it's weird, like that's going to look completely different. So so, so, so I, get the, I guess the question if it, is this concept of timelessness, Josh, that you, 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 you kind of you turn to. That it's a, so it is, is taste timeless? Is taste relevant? Uh, how much of this is taste and how much of this is, is, is objective? Uh, anyone in particular you want to kind of comment on that? Josh, do you, do you want to touch on, on, on the concept of timelessness? Because I think this is important. I think timelessness it might be where we draw this line. Well, I, the purpose, my reason for choosing timelessness was that if something gets torn down or something served an immediate purpose, it's of no continual value. So will will visual screens, will digital screens be completely valuable going forward when we might be living in a much more augmented and virtual reality life in, in that way? So it, it, the, the question of how do you, how would we or, or you know someone like Nicholas uh, future-proof their technologies, I think I'm not so worried about an entire built environment becoming a sort of a, a, a Blade Runner-esque uh, digital landscape. I don't think it can even get through a planning application <laughs> as one thing. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. That will, over time, affect people's experience. Um, however, different visual landscapes do not have um, an epigenetic effect on, uh, I know, I finally got it out. Yeah. I'll use that word, I don't know what it means. Uh, they're, they're not actually changing our brains from generation to generation. Um, they are trying to study whether uh, iPads are having an effect on children's uh, depth of field at the moment, um, spending too long looking at screen, that there is affecting their general born uh, abilities for perception and depth. Uh, but it might just be a sense of plasticity. It might be temporary. So the idea of will all these digital screens affect us and affect our general experience, they will in, in context, but I don't think that they will change us dramatically and change our markers of how we're going to have to like rewrite everything about how we understand the visual elements. Can I, thank can I just add one tiny thing to that? Um, you know, we need to build for the now and for the conceivable future and for the technology and the changes that are before us. Whenever you look at a film or a comic uh, from 20, 30, 50 years ago of the future, their imagined future, it is self-evidently ridiculous to us now because it is their technology you know, changed. I mean, look at Star Wars where it's sort of ridiculous IT that somehow it's a 1970s style. So most attempts to build for the, you know, if you like, the far future, get it wrong. I think we're better off building for the conceivable future. And as Josh says, that the human animal, the human emotional needs are remarkably consistent. If you go back and look at a Greek city, at a Sumerian city in the, in, the, in the findings, if a Chinese person comes to London, if a London person goes to China, there's much more consistency in, in what we have need, what we needed, need, and I would argue will need, than, than it's probably fashionable always to concede. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. There's two questions at the back, Matt, if you can throw your green box at them. So I, I think I think if I if, if I can if I can add to that as well because I think it's a good it's an interesting point this, the, the role of policy 
So policy tries to, planning policy in particular, tries to kind of draw a line of what is quality, what do we fix, what bits should we fix in the built environment? I'll, I'll answer quickly then pass over. Um, so I would give you, I think you said you were a, a planner, I would, I would try and give you confidence. Um, it is true that at an individual level, uh, experience is subjective and unpredictable. I repeat my point, at a population level, that's just not true. I mean, I didn't have time to show it, but some of the early work on this you know, gets to between 60 and 70% of people's response to a place is mathematically a function of the place, not of who they are. Not entirely, but you really can see the trends. Types of places people like are quite predictable. A bit of greenery, but on a human scale, that word again, come back to what that means. Uh, more complicated facades, good place to walk, place where the climate is attractive. You know, you can predict these things. It's not the only prism on a good place because you've got to come back and ask the health and the way all being questions as well. So I would try and give you confidence that you can measure these things at a population level, not at a philosophical or an individual level. And then secondly, on the policy, um, again, something I didn't have time to say, but I think is incredibly important and very relevant for those of you who are professional planners in the room. Um, I mean, both sides of the political debate get this completely wrong. So on the, uh, on the, on the left, it's, you know, planning was created post-war to save us from evil developers. And on the right, I'm being a bit crude here, you know, evil planning was created post-war and shackled the free market. They're both complete bollocks. Um, planning has existed in this country and in every civilization for a millennia. Uh, the earliest data that we're aware of in Britain of what we would now call planning is from the 7th century in Winchester with clearly regulated patterns of land use. There is extant data, sorry, extant documents, I should say, from 12th century London, very clearly showing that, not surprisingly, the Corporation of London was busy planning how land was used because that is something that cities have to do, just as governments have to have armies and protect you from outside invaders. So the, the key point to come to your question is that planning needs to be predictable and set a clear framework of what is set, which we would argue you can link to some of the data, but then once you get beyond that data, and this is to your point about the spontaneity, set some rules. So Georgian and Victorian London and Paris and Amsterdam had very clear rules about what was and wasn't acceptable, but beyond those rules, you could really do what you liked, and there's no development control. So you know you can have the, the muse or the street that has putty in or lets the cobbles go in a funny way, but it's just because it's a street pattern and some, some of the basic materials you're controlling and arguably nothing else. Ed, uh, Ed uh, I mean, you're a designer. Do you think uh, uh, you should have policies that set out what good design is? I think they're very helpful, yeah. I mean, I think there's... One I was hoping actually to hear was that someone was going to design the algorithms for all the things I don't like doing. <laughs> uh, and now I could just pick those up and do the fun bit. Which is, I think that's what I was taught actually at UCL was that... We were, we're all liberated artists once the, um, the technology uh, embodies enough <laughs> of the grudge. We'll do babies for you. We'll, we'll, we'll do well, I, I'm gonna, cause I've got the microphone, I'm going to ask some stuff, because I'm worried about like, the privilege of this data that you're collecting. I'm, pr I'm worried about how it can be used, and I know it, it can be... It, you, you can gain a commercial advantage, or you could analyse lots of streets of London and know that these ones are going to be really popular. And then I think you've already responded. There is a mark already. There's a, there's a set of data that very clearly identifies um, the quality of streetscape and housing by the, how much houses cost. You know, um, That's just a very, very easy thing to understand. Yeah. Uh, just before you do, because I want you to, to, to also extrapolate, uh, work a little bit. We probably don't have any time for any more questions. I'm going to ask the last question because I'm selfish. That's where I am. But uh, just w w one thing, w w Simone, for you. So you talked about uh, you talked about. Uh, sorry, let me just find here. Peak quality. Yeah. Sometimes things get too good, and that's a problem. And you also talk about uh, once we start looking at algorithms and quantifying quality of place, things become replicable and identical streets. If you can just touch on that uh, as as a last point. Yeah, I just wanted to, to reply to that question about um, how do you measure and how do you actually make sure that in the planning system we have those um, things. So I think it's important to look at usage, how many people actually use the places that you are creating. Um, that is a huge indicator of the quality of the street, of the place that you are creating, of the residential developments, how many people actually live in those buildings. It's very important usage. Um, and the way you can actually use all of the analytics and all the big data is by um, really pulling together all those data sets um, to inform policy because policy 
is flexible, changes once the evidence becomes available. So if the evidence is not there yet, um, quantifiable, then uh, people are not going to make a change in, in policy. Um, this idea about reaching peak quality kind of came about because if you look at places like Oxford Street or really um, old uh, historical city centers uh, across Europe um, and really everywhere in the world. Um, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy where you are trying to um, attract more people by improving the design. And until it gets to a point where it becomes actually uncomfortable for people, a lot of, I know a lot of people that avoid Oxford Street um, intentionally because it's just impossible to walk. And um, that is kind of one of the key questions that um, I have as well. How do we actually have that in our uh, planning system to make sure that when we are um, looking at the benefits that we are achieving by improving the space, um, we are looking also at the scale of those benefits because sometimes we might be adding things, but the, the, the impact is going to be very low. So maybe the money could be directed somewhere else. Yes. Uh, thank you, Simona. Uh, Thank you all for coming. I don't think we actually answered, can we measure the quality of place? I didn't expect to answer, but I, I, I think there's, a few, there's definitely consensus that we can measure some aspects. Uh, and, and, and it always brings me back to kind of, uh, Yang Gao famously says that we know more about Siberian tigers than we know about the Homo sapien. So maybe we need to start understanding a little bit about, about us before we actually start to be able to really kind of uh, get down and, 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 and design places by numbers. But I think for now, if we can, uh, a round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much. And thank you all for uh, spending the, the, your lunchtime uh, in the basement when it's really sunny outside. Yeah.